Alrighty, hello everybody and welcome back. Here we are with the second experiment of the three-part series. In this experiment here, we're going to be going over introducing animations as well as um, the MechAnim system in Unity, which is the animator window. So two new windows we're going to be covering today and utilizing moving forward, the animation window and then the animator window, uh, both inside of Unity. So before we get started, first thing we should do is go to Perforce, of course. So for the second experiment, again, we're going to be editing the scene. So inside of your scenes folder of your project here, we're going to go into the IND229 folder, this folder here, and then into the wind turbine scene. Check that out with the meta file. And now for this experiment, I've chosen to, you know, keep everything contained in this folder. So far, we just have the prefab in the wind turbine experiments folder. If you want to put the prefab in the prefabs folder and the scripts in the scripts folder and stay organized however you'd like, that's up to you. But stay organized. Understand where those files are in your project and check them out in Perforce. Because everything I'm doing for this experiment is inside of this wind turbine experiments folder, I'm just going to check out the folder itself. I mean, all files contained in it will be checked out as well. <laughs> all right, so now, now I have four things checked out, right? The, the prefab. Uh, the meta file for that prefab, which is the, the vital, the vital meta file. Sometimes for the scenes and the scripts, the meta file isn't always constantly changing. Good habit to get into to always check it out, uh, because for prefabs, those meta files are going to be updating. <laughs> right, and then we have the scene as well as the meta file for that. Right, so four files, but the the meta files are just the additional files that are carried with the scene and the prefab itself. So with those checked out, let's go back into Unity. And here we are. This is where we left off from the first experiment. So before we get started, again, let's do a little test. Rotate the pivot uh, game object just to make sure it's still working. Right? This is basically the preview of what we want our animation to look like and how it's going to function. So going into window, we have two windows, the animation window and the animator window. Both we're going to be using today and covering, so a lot of new information. So in the animation window, this is where you're going to create objects or create animations for the objects you've already created, for these game objects you want to actually animate. You're going to create the clips of what the animations look like. Overall, what you're doing in this window is setting uh, poses in snapshots of time. So basically, you're going to be setting keyframes, right? Those are your small little snapshots at positions here in the timeline. In the timeline, uh, the computer, the system itself, is going to interpolate between those two poses, and it's going to blend before you. So you're taking snip snippets, and then the system is going to give you back a story, right? As it reads through the reads through the timeline, right? It's going to give you that blend. So here you'll see in the animation window it says no animate no animatable object selected. So you should probably ask yourself, what do we do here? We select the object that we want to animate. So you can select any object you can see here, but now you need to ask yourself, what do we want to have the animator on? So moving forward, you may not know specifically why we're choosing this one. I've labeled it animate me because I knew ahead of time, but it's because we want this object to spin. We want this to animate, right? And then we put the children inside so we can see what will happen here. So here, when we select the pivot, I'm going to hit create. Now Unity does a great job here of actually telling us where do we want these files to go, right? So here it's going to say where do we want this animation clip to be saved? Well, if you look the path is being put into my wind turbine experiments folder, uh, just be careful. Make sure you understand where this file is being saved so we can add it to Perforce. This clip is going to be called the idle, right? The very first animation clip that we want here. Right? And right away, you see that this window has now been updated, right? We have a little bit more control. Also notice what's been happening in your project, right? I'm also going to take the time to go over this because this is very important going forward. Becoming just, you know, you're transitioning from you've now been the designer that's gotten their feet wet in Unity. Now you're moving forward to actually being a professional where you're using this tool every day. And this is no longer just something you're getting used to, but you're becoming proficient in. Understand that two assets are now being created in our project. Right here is this idle clip. You'll see idle.anim. This is the animation clip itself. 
So when we change anything in this window about the idle clip, we're changing this file right here. So you're probably asking yourself, well, when this gets added to Perforce, we want to check this out if we're going to make any changes to the clip itself. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. If not, you know, definitely go back and look at earlier, uh, earlier videos where I cover the basics of Perforce. So, also, we have this Pivot Animate Me controller. Okay, so what this is, you'll see the name has been created from the game object that the animator was assigned to. Right, but this controller, when we go inside of the animator window, when we start to make edits to the different states and how they transition inside of this window, we're changing this file right here, the Pivot underscore Animate Me. All right, also notice now on the Pivot animate me game object we have an animator component that unity assigned for us with the controller that's referenced to this object right so this needs to be a part of your, your unity package or in the scene in the project that you want to actually reference these different states that we set up All right so two new files in our in our um, wind turbine experiments folder that we're going to want to add to perforce okay so back to the animation window here this you'll see up top, this is the timeline, right? And this red bar right here, this red stripe through the window, this represents where we are in time, right? So we're gonna move these different positions and take our snapshots or position the objects how we want to, and then it will blend between them over time. So you have to click in the timeline itself. You can't click in this window down here, it's in the red bar. So you have to make sure you're moving this to the position you want and then setting the keyframe. Over in the top here, definitely some important buttons to pay attention to. This record button, uh, this will allow you to any changes that you make in the editor are going to be recorded in the window for you, right? So you'll see if I hit this record, notice that these buttons have turned red as a warning, letting you know, hey, you're recording right now, so you probably shouldn't be entering play mode. So as you make any changes or updates, uh, those uh, keyframes are going to be recorded in this window. So just be careful when this button is on. Right, play is going to allow you to preview and play the animation. You see now this that red bar is moving on its own. Right, this is going to give us a preview of the animation. This number here represents what what frame you're currently on. Right, so uh, if you jump to you know 30 frames, you know everyone should know there's 60 frames in a second when we're running games. So at 30 frames, right, this is you know half of a second into our animation. Right, the samples do not change this. This is the speed at which the animation is running, so keep this at 60. Don't adjust this at all to try and make your animation slower or faster. This idle here, this basically represents which clip we're working on. Right, We're going to start with the idle state, and for our wind turbine, it's just going to be the off state. This button here allows you to add a keyframe, and this button here allows you to add an animation event. This is more advanced, but definitely within every designer's uh, tool set and everyone should start to become very comfortable with this. So we're not going to go over it in this video, but check it out in upcoming videos. All right, now to this add property button, which everyone's probably ready to click already. So when I click add property, this allows me to select which property I actually want to animate. So uh, if you understand what we've been doing so far, you probably understand we want to animate the rotation of the transform component. All right, if I select the pivot game object, and here we see in the inspector what this game object looks like, right? If I go to add properties, this looks awfully familiar, right? Here we have the transform component, that's right here. Here we have the sphere collider, right? That's right here. So we can animate if, you know, the center, where it's located, if it's enabled or not, if it's a trigger volume, the size of it, right? The overall radius, whoops, it's a mistake. We also have access to the mesh renderer, right? So we can, inside of here, we can now start to animate if it's, if we can see the object or not, uh, the color of it, start animating the materials. You see these, all these properties we have access to, to animate over time, right? We don't need to do that, but start to recognize the pattern here and understand how this is working, right? Now we'll look at what these are, blade, blade one, blade two, and then turbine light. What are these, right? These aren't components. These are the children game objects, right? So this is going to allow us to animate multiple objects within one simple animation. Rather than creating multiple clips 
with multiple animators for everything, we can do it in one easy place, which I'm going to do with my light here. So to get started in the idle state, let's just go with the transform right, rotation. That's what we want to animate on this wind turbine. All right, so right away, the animation comes up, and you see two keyframes get added, one at the beginning at zero seconds, one at one second. Okay? So also, we see down here we have these two buttons, the dope sheet and the curves. Okay, so what the dope sheet is going to represent is all of your keyframes in a grid form, almost like a spreadsheet. Uh, if you can envision it, these small diamonds will be placed along here and it will look like in a grid form. What this information doesn't show you is how the system is blending from the beginning to the end. All right, so I hit play. Right now you're going to see no motion. All right, nothing at all is happening. Right. One thing you may want to pay attention to, now you probably notice your rotation uh, has the salmon color to this, these attributes. That is a way that the, the software communicates that that attribute has a keyframe on it in some way. Um, other systems use this as well. Uh, After Effects, Maya, all use that same color. Um, so you, that's good, just a quick way to tell, hey, this has a keyframe on it in case uh, that didn't mean, need to be. It's a way to catch it. All right, so the dope sheet is going to represent everything in in um, spreadsheet form, you know, or in grid form, but doesn't show you how you're getting from point A to point B. So you see two keyframes here, but when I hit play, you don't see any motion, right? Let's go look at the curves, right? And if we're going into rotation, let's just look at rotation Z, because that's what we're going to be rotating. All right, look at this, this line here. So ask yourself, what is the slope of this line? Right. Hopefully you said the slope of this line is zero because that's the answer, right? The slope of this line is zero, right? Change in y over change in x, right? It's not changing uh, in y, so zero, and then no change in or you know change in x, but zero divided by anything is zero. So no slope here, right? Zero slope. So this results in no change. A lot of animating comes down to the ability to read a graph. If you can understand the slope of a line and starting to uh, blend the two and what a slope, what the graph will look like before you even animate, you're going to be able to build everything much quicker and, and stop guessing and what the animation should look like, or what the graph should look like, right? So that's why we have no animation, right? No movement because the slope is zero from start to finish, okay? So we can go ahead and delete the second keyframe because we don't have any motion in here. Um, but what we can do uh, you know, if, if picture your idle animation, this is your off state. You could have something spinning, or I'm, let's go ahead and add my light. You could have a light flashing in the idle state. So you can have an actual movement here. This is just the idle state. It doesn't mean it has to be, you know, zero frames long. Let's go ahead and add that turbine light. And now in here, we have access to all of the turbine lights components. So here we have is active. We're going to keep it on. We have the transform if we wanted to move it. And then here in the light itself, here's all the attributes. So I want to animate the light's intensity. That sounds pretty fun. We could also do the color. Uh, maybe we can go back and edit that after. So let's get it working first, and we can go and add that afterwards. So right now, the intensity is set to 1. Should be what it is. All right, that looks good. Now let's go on and create another clip. So let's create a clip in here, and let's call this the spinning animation. All right, now you notice another clip added to our folder. All right, so inside here, let's go ahead and add that property again, the rotation. And let's also add in the turbine lights, light intensity. I apologize, I think I want the range. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove that property. Come back to idle, let me remove that, and let me add the range. And then before I can actually test it, so with that turned off, I'm just going to adjust the range. Yeah, that'll give me a good, good effect. So keep it at 10. All right, so going back to the spinning now. All right, so notice... We have these two keyframes, 
And now let's actually put some movement on here. So at zero seconds, we want the position to be at zero. All right, so if we drag this all the way to the end, right where this keyframe is, so at one second, we want this to be at 360 degrees. So you can have the record on and grab this and start to rotate it. Uh, if that's one way you want to actually, oh, that was a light. I apologize. So you can grab the object and actually rotate it, and you'll see that record is happening, right? That is updating here and in the inspector. Um, more often than not, the workflow I like to have is just typing in the value I want. Right? Rather than finessing that, you can just get the whole value, and now you have that in there. Right? So now it's blending from 0 over time to 360. Right? This doesn't show us how it's blending, so let's go ahead and hit play and see what this looks like. All right, so it's moving. All right, step one. We've got it moving. We've got it spinning. You'll see it goes all the way to the end and then stops, right? Or it doesn't stop. It slows down, and then we can clearly see where it starts again. So this isn't a seamless or fully blended animation. All right, let's look at the curve, and let's just look at the Z axis, right? Rotation.Z. So with this window, with that selected, right, if you hit F in the window, that will frame up the graph itself. So we can take a second just to look at the graph and what's happening, right? Let's go back to what the slope of this line is. So at this point, the slope of this point is zero, right? It's very flat. And then it's starting to blend and approach a more constant value, right? The closer it gets to one or to a vertical line, uh, the faster the motion, right? So it's going slow, it's starting to speed up, starting to speed up, approaching a constant speed, approaching a constant speed, starting to slow down, starting to slow down, and coming to rest, right? So when it starts to loop over time, it's going to drop off like that and start to slow down and speed up. We want it to be constant, right? So the motion is constant. Starting to be, be able to read these graphs gives you a lot of uh, understanding of what the motion will look like when you hit this play button, right? And you can also see if you drag, you can preview the animation of what happens in the scene, uh, very easily, right? So you get an idea of what it, what it looks like. So the way to adjust this, right, is if we right-click on the keyframe, we have some options, right? We can edit, we can delete it. Down here, these are the tangents for this point or this keyframe. So auto is going to give you that constant linear progression, right? Very, no blending at all, just directly there, or complete uh, interpolation over time. Right, flat is going to break it and basically, or not break it, I apologize, is going to flatten it out completely and make that point zero. Then from there you see you have these little handles, right, and you can tweak and manipulate these to give it that uh, effect that you want or give you that small little ability to control it. And then broken, mm -hmm. if you have a keyframe in the middle at any point, let's go ahead and add a keyframe. If I break the tangents, you'll see I have left and right control separately. Right. This allows you to do some things like, uh, you know, a bouncing ball would have a, a point like this where it comes in and then immediately hits and then goes forward. So it gives you control of each side. That's what broken will do. So auto is what we're going to use. So let me go ahead and delete that keyframe. On this tangent, I'm going to go down to auto. And then on the top tangent, I'm going to go to auto. All right. So now we have this linear line. Right? So now ask yourself, what is the slope of this line? Right? The slope is constant. Right? It's a constant value uh, from start to finish. Right? It never changes. It's the, so what do you think the motion will be? Right? The motion will be constant. So if I hit play, notice how it's a continuously looping. And because the 0 and 360 are the same value, when it gets to the end, it starts over and will just continue to, to blend and loop over time. Right, so the, as the user, you never see where the animation begins and ends. It looks seamless. Right? So now, let's go ahead and add the light property as well. So uh, let's go ahead and add the turbine light. Right? And we're going to do the, the range is what I want to animate. Right? So at, let's go back to the dope sheet. Because right, notice, right, we changed the graph of this 
of this slope value, right? Or we, I apologize. We change the graph of this uh, of this property, right? Of the rotation, right? But if you go back to the dope sheet, we don't see any difference. So it just shows us where they are located in time. It doesn't give us any type of blending information. So that's where you go back and forth between the two. So uh, at halfway between this animation, I want um, my light here to be, let's go with uh, 15. 15. So it's going to start at 10, go up to 15, and then go back down to 10. All right, let's see if it's enough to even notice. Let's jack it up a little bit more to 20. All right, yeah, you can start to notice it down here on the ground, and it's starting to glow a bit more. All right, now let's go into the curve and see what the curve looks like. Again, so select that and hit F. All right, it looks like a good, a good range. What we can do is even adjust it. Maybe it needs to start a bit, uh, a, a bit less than 10. So let's put this down to 7. And then at the end, drag over here, right, to the end here, back over to 7. So this is just another little finishing touch I wanted to add to this to represent, um, you know, one that you can do multiple things with animation, not just move objects, but also the hierarchy, right? This hierarchy that I'm building is very important. All right, so now if I preview that, right, much more apparent that it's blinking. So good, to, good start. We can tone it down a bit further if it's too much later, but we have something in there working. All right, so now what we can do is let's go back to the idle and make sure this is at 10, right? So these will match when it blends from one state to the next. All right, now a little bit about understanding time, right, and distance over time. So one thing we can do is um, we can shorten or uh, lengthen the distance of this, the time it takes for this object to complete this uh, cycle, right, depending on what we need it to have happen in that amount of time. Right, so one way to make this object move faster, right, if we want this to spin faster, what we could do is we could take the um, keyframe here at the end and move it closer. All right, so I'm going to take this keyframe and move it to 30 seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and disable our light for now so you can't see that. I'm just going to talk about the concepts of the animation. All right, so now it's traveling from zero to 360 degrees in half of a second, right? So same amount of distance it's traveling, but it's doing in half the amount of time, right? So it's going to spin faster, okay? Going back, though, if instead we want it to still be one second, right? The animation still needs to be one second, but we want it to spin faster. Instead of 360 degrees, we can try 720. Turn the light again to make it consistent. So now if I hit play, oh, oh, I see there, be careful, I just animated the light turning off. All right, so that's a mistake on my part. I'm going to go ahead and delete that property, go back to the beginning. And I want to turn record off and then just disable this light. That was a mistake on my part. You can always just delete that property or delete that keyframe. All right, so now notice it's still one second long. One second long animation, um, but the uh, it's spinning the exact same speed if it was you know half the amount of time. All right, so you know the opposite would be if we want to make this slower and we want it to spin, we can increase this to be two seconds long. All right, increasing the amount of time it's taking to travel the same distance. All right, so now it's spinning from uh, still from 0 to 360, but it's taking two seconds to get there, right? Spinning much slower. Uh, uh, even though it's traveling the same distance, it's much slower. All right. So now we have our two animations. Let me get it back to the distance I want. Let's actually make this. Um, I'm going to mix it up. Let's make this two seconds, the spinning animation two seconds. Maybe we'll make my light, won't make my light look so obnoxious if it's a little bit longer. So let me turn record off, because now I just want to re-enable this. 
Okay, so now from 0 to 1 second, it's going to blend from 7. Look at just my lights. From 7 to 20, and then back down should go back to 7. All right, we should have that smooth animation. So let's preview that and see what it looks like. All right, good start so far. So one thing I like to do as well is I'm going to go ahead and add a third state. All right, I'm going to add a wind-up state. All right. Okay, in this wind-up state, this is going to be the transition between our idle state, our off state, and our spinning state, right, which is going to be the on state. All right, so if you think about your doorway that you're going to have to create in the upcoming assignment, how many states do you think that's actually going to be? All right, the answer is four. All right, so we have the, the idle state where the door is closed, right, so we can call that idle closed. Then from there, we have the door opening, right, so door open. Then we have idle open, where the door is just staying open. And then we have door closing, where the door closes back and returns to idle close, right, so four states. So we have two so far. I'm going to create a third one, and then you'll be responsible to be creating all four for the door itself. So I'm going to go ahead and create another clip. Let's call this wind up. And again, this gives us a good opportunity to play with the curves a bit more and the tangents to get a nice turning on effect. All right. So let's add our property. This is going to be the rotation. All right. So what we want here is it to start at zero and end up at 360, but we want to adjust how it gets there. All right, so we want it to take a little bit longer, right? Rather than just one second, right? This is our, this is too fast, right? We want it to take a little bit longer, so we're going to increase this length. Let's try three seconds, okay? And then let's go into the curve itself, and let's select the Z because that's what we're just focusing on, and hit F, okay? So let's adjust this tangent over here. If we set this to auto, and now grab this little handle and control. All right, we want a curve that looks something like this to start. All right, so if, let's just look at the graph before I hit play and see what you think this might do. All right, this is starting at rest, starting with a slope of zero, slowly picking up speed, getting faster and faster, and getting very, very fast and still linear, right? This portion here is starting to become linear where this tangent is. So we want this to match as best as possible with the slope of the uh, spinning animation, which we'll have to do in the animator and then we can tweak that to get it just right. All right, so now we'll hit play and see what this looks like. So it's slowly starting to turn on, slowly starts, and it stops there, right, because that's where it's going to blend into the actual spinning state. Right, we'll transition from one to the next when it gets to the end here. All right, but that's just about something we want. And you can, you know, tweak this uh, while it's previewing to start to see the adjustment, because we want it to transition from that pretty much into here, right, into this. So we can also get a little effect on our light as well. So going from spinning, or from wind up, right, if it's at seven, it's also seven in our idle, yes. So now we can even go back to our idle. Let's turn this even lower. Let's turn this to two, or four. All right, so now it's at four. Okay, now let's go back to our um, wind up, we can start the light at four, turbine light, light, range, start this at four, and it's ending up at seven, so we can even do a blend like that, and it's really what you want to have happen in this. You could have it flashing in here, you could have it changing colors when it's winding up, it's whatever communication you want to give the player. Uh, but try and make it blend uh, really well from from uh, state to state, which we'll get to. All right, so we want this to be linear. All right, we can have it start off slow, and then we can have it speed up towards the end. I'm just going to adjust that. The red graph might be a little hard to see, but yeah, now that I select it, you can see it a bit better. So that'll be similar. Right? We want to match the motion and the light. We want to match uh, as well as possible. So you see, it slowly gets brighter. Right, and then it will blend into the next state from there. Right, so now we have those created. 
What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to save my project because I like the project progress I've made so far. Right? I think everyone should as well. We have these uh, clips, right? Right, we, that we've created in our project. So let's get those on purpose and safe so we don't ever lose that work. One thing we should also do before we go forward is apply our changes to the prefab. Right, so now if I go ahead and hit apply, right, now if I drop in multiple of these, these should all have the animator on it, right, and it's all referencing it, right? So that's what we're updating when we hit apply. And it's got the light, got all those cool pieces ready to be uh, implemented. All right, so we have all those pieces. I'm going to come back to Perforce, and now I'm going to um, submit my changes. All right. So to do so, I'm going to again come back to my Wind Turbine Experiments folder. Let's go ahead and mark that for Add. All right. So I look in my workspace. It may show it. Nope. Let's go ahead and mark this for Add, and we should see those new files come in. All right there, they are now. My idle animation, my pivot controller the spinning animation, and then the, the, the uh, wind-up animation as well, right? All in there, now added to that same change list. So I'm going to go ahead and submit this change list. Okay? So you can use the, you know, completed wind turbine experiment if you're finished. I do encourage everybody, though, to submit your progress along the way. So I'm going to say created animation clips. Um, you know, halfway through experiment two, wind turbine. All right, so now I have everything submitted. So moving forward in this experiment and then into the third, there's two um, there's two techniques I want to show off uh, in Perforce. Two actions that you may want to utilize in the future. So the first one I'm going to cover is what's called reconcile offline work. All right, so um, the, the other is going to be revert unchanged files. All right, we know a little bit about revert files, so I'm going to cover that one as well. So reconcile offline work is designed um, to be utilized if you're not connected to the Internet. All right, that's the main intention of it. So if you're working offline, right, notice the name, um, you can then connect back to the, the server and then get all the work you've changed back on the depot. Right. That being said, if you don't understand the main basics of Perforce, as in checking out, mark for delete, mark for add, these three right here, using this, you're asking for trouble. Right. So make sure you understand the basics before you start to utilize this soft, this feature at all. Okay. So it, this does work pretty well with Unity, um, but again, shouldn't be your main workflow. It is oftentimes can result in problems especially with those that aren't super familiar with Perforce at first. Right? After a while, it can come in handy when you need to use it. Right? So to demonstrate how this could work, I'm not going to check out any files. Right? I don't have an internet connection, say, and I can't um, work on my assignment, or I can't get my files checked out on the depot. Okay? So what we can do here is I'm not going to check anything out. Let's just go back to Unity. All right, so I'm continuing on with the second experiment. Okay, so from here, after we have our clips, we're going to go into the animator. All right, inside the animator, right, this is the animator window itself. Nothing is selected, so it doesn't give you a preview like the animation. Um, you need to select the object that you uh, want to look at the animator for. Right, that will be our pivot, right? So look what Unity has done for us already. Unity has created these states. Let me show the inspector. Right, they've created these states that um, are associated with this object right, in this controller. So right, notice when we're looking in this window, we're looking at this object right here, the pivot, animate, pivot underscore animate me dot controller. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're changing right now in this window. Okay. So these are the different states right here. Notice how the motion has been plugged into these, right? So if you select them and look in the inspector, you see the motion has been applied, right? Here is the actual clip being referenced in our project, right? So if you ever need to create a new state, 
it's not just you can't just name it idle and the idle animation will play it's actually being referenced to the clip of what the motion looks like it's just nice to have them named the exact same right this entry state um, this is basically if the object is instantiated or spawned in right think of an enemy right if you instantiate an enemy into the world um, you know what state is is that enemy entering in patrol you know idle attack what is that state that you want them to begin in the exit state usually way off to the right hand side not used nearly as often and um, not a requirement to get these things working um, but this would be if the object is destroyed um, or pretty much is no longer existing in the world you can have it leave in one final state that you set up so all these states now exist we want to um, start to define how they get from one um, object to the next right how they get from one area to the next so what we're going to do is uh, make those connections right so if your entry state is not on the idle for some reason if it's on the spinning or wind up you can right click on entry and you only have a few options but you know you can set the default state machine right so it's going to default to spinning right we want ours to default to idle so I'm just going to bring it back to idle and that one should be orange Okay, from here, it's very easy to make transitions. You can just right click, make transition, and connect to spinning. From here, right click on spinning, make transition to wind up. If you make a mistake, oh, and I did. Look at that. I already made a mistake. Right? I don't want it to going from spinning to wind up. I want it going from idle to wind up. Right? So what we want to do is delete these. Right? So there's no option to delete. You need to actually hit function delete on your keyboard, right? or just delete if you're on a regular PC. But you need to delete them uh, that way. So try this again. Right click on idle, make transition to wind up. Wind up to spinning, right? Then right click from spinning back to idle. Right? So now we have this loop. So now you may be wondering, OK, what's going to happen if we hit play? Right? So a big thing to keep in mind for these both of these two first two experiments, you don't need the character, right? You didn't need the character to build this wind turbine. You don't need the character to test if these states are working properly. So don't even add in the hub scene until the third experiment, right? Now if we go ahead and hit play, and we're just going to use the scene view, right? Just free your mouse, and then or you don't need to free your mouse, but just go over here to the scene view, right? You should see the motion, okay? Right, and this auto live link does a great job of showing us what state we're in. If you're having issues where the auto live link is not working uh, and you have this button checked on, so make sure it's checked on and close this window. So do this while Unity is running. I found this to be a solution or a workaround. So while Unity is running, go to Window Animator. So just open it back up. Right, select your pivot object and it should repopulate. I've had that work many times successfully for me. Uh, just closing the window and then opening up again should work for you. All right. So now you see that it's going from state to state just fine, but there's no uh, control of it. It's just going from one to the next. It's not stopping at any state. So if you think about how we want this to work from a user perspective, we want it to stay in the idle state all right, until we tell it to go to the next state. We want it to play the wind up, transition to spinning, and stay spinning until we tell it to turn off right, and go back to idle. So we want to set up those, those conditions. So we see the clips are working, but it doesn't look and control how we want it to just yet. All right, so I'm going to stop Unity. And now looking back at the animator, we have these two tabs, layers and parameters. Okay, layers we're not going to be utilizing. Um, you may use them by the time you get the final project, I'm sure. Um, what these are used for, though, if, you, if we're talking about a, a character, right, a character, uh, you know, a third-person controller may have uh, different abilities depending on the game, right? So many open-world games, the player can swim, right? Assassin's Creed, if you jump in water, you can actually swim around. So when you're playing those games, and we're just going to focus about uh, using a keyboard, if you press W, the player moves forward, right? And they play the walk forward animation, right? If you press A or D, the player um, 
perform, they strafe left or right, and they play the strafe left or strafe right animation. Right? Each one of those is a state the player enters. Well, if you jump in the water, the controls are still the same. Right? When I press W, I'm moving forward, but I'm no longer playing the walk forward animation. I'm playing the swim forward animation. Right, or I'm playing the, you know, same thing with crouch. If I press C and crouch, and then I press W, I'm now playing the crouch walk forward animation. Different animation altogether. Right, so those are, exist on different layers. You'd have a swim layer. You'd have your crouching layer. You'd have the base layer, which controls the standard uh, character movement. Uh, from there, you can also use it for things like more complex idle animations. If you ever see a character that's you know, sitting around, and then all of a sudden they you know, pull out a cigarette or put a hand through their put their hand through their hair or play with their hat or you know, pull out a guitar. Or, you know, you can see games that have all types of complex idle animations. They can enter the idle layer and blend between all of those until the user um, puts in any type of input and then trans transition back to the base layer. So that's what that's used for on a high level. Um, we just need to start to learn the basics with animating and setting up these states. So we're, what we're going to use is the parameters. So if you hit this little plus sign here, right, these, this little plus sign gives you all of this information, right, of what types of parameters we can make. Float, integer, and boolean, those should sound familiar. You should know those terms. Trigger is just like a boolean, except there's no set value, right? Boolean is true or false. A trigger just sits and waits for it to be triggered and hit, and then it returns back to its uh, triggerable state. So you almost think of it as a Boolean that gets set to true and immediately triggered back to false, waiting to get hit again. So if you need to store the actual value, you can use a bool. If it's just something to trigger, um, trigger is what you can use. So try them both out, and you can experiment. Definitely, they can be used in different situations. So a Boolean is what we're going to use, and we're going to call this toggle spin. All right, so in the toggle spin, right, now see we have this Boolean, right? We can trigger it, that's false, now it's true. Now we can use that Boolean to as a condition between our different states. So selecting the actual transition, right, the arrow between idle and wind up, let's look in the, let me put my inspector down here, you see we have some states, or we have some uh, information. All right, down here is the list of conditions. So if you hit the plus sign, we've now created a new condition in here, toggle spin, right, and that equals true, right, so it's only going to transition from idle to spinning, or from idle to wind up when toggle spin is true, okay, going from wind up to spinning, right, here, what condition do we need here, we don't, right, we don't need a condition at all, because in our scenario, we want the wind up animation to play one time, and immediately going to go to spinning, right? We want that to happen every time. Then it's going to sit in spinning and loop. So we don't need a condition here at all, right? Going from spinning to idle, right? Is going to we want this to be the opposite, right? So when toggle spin is false. So oftentimes I'll see students want to create two booleans, right? One to go this way and one to go back. But because the toggle spin has two values. We can use it for two transitions, right? Again, the difference between a Boolean and a trigger. Right? We're using it uh, in two different ways. So now let's test this and see what happens. All right, again, let's just look at the scene view. All right, so now you'll see it's sitting in idle, right? And it's going to sit there and wait in idle as long as uh, this is set to false. But as soon as I hit it to true, it's going to transition to wind up, play wind up once, and now sit in the spinning animation infinitely, right? It's going to go and uh, go and go forever until I turn it off, and it's going to go back to idle. So one thing you may notice, right, is when I check this off or check this on, either one, it, it takes a second for it to actually transition. So you can see when I deactivate this, as soon as I, I'm going to try and deactivate it as soon as the animation starts. And notice how it, it uh, waits for the entire animation to finish before it transitions. So from here, I'll press it right now. 
See, it plays the whole animation and then transitions. All right, if I do it again on this side, it plays the animation, then finishes. So it's a very, very minor delay. It's not a big issue. Um, but if you want to control that, that is the exit time. So if you select the transition itself, you'll see here this has exit time. Okay? So in the settings, right, you can actually adjust what the length of the exit time is. And you'll see when you change this, you're actually adjusting that small graph down there. Right? So this is basically showing you how much of the animation will blend together, right? What percentage it will start to blend the two together. This is much more useful with like character movement and things, but again, it comes in handy with things like this. Anything that's completely off, you don't really need to have an exit time. So what I would do is just going from idle to wind up, I would turn it off completely. So now we see when I go and interact again, no matter when I uh, trigger this, it's going to immediately turn on, right? So I'll press it right when it starts, and you'll see it'll cut and transition right away. Right, it just cuts off and starts going again. Do it one more time. See, and it cuts off and starts to spin. All right, so the last thing you'll see that I'm going to correct before I go back and reconcile my offline work is you'll notice that little hiccup, right, because the blend between wind up and spinning isn't quite perfect. It's not the transition, it's the slope of the graph itself. See how it spins, it gets faster and then slows. Uh, we can tweak the graph to match that as best as we can. Right, so that's in the actual animation. So window animation, so we got over here. All right, and now let's go look at the curve for the, oh, let's look up the uh, wind up. And we want the rotation of the Z. And let's just tone this down a little bit. And this is a little bit of trial and error. There's no way around it. It does just take a lot of, you know, tweak it, go ahead, test it, see how it looks. I mean, that's part of the uh, art side of things is testing those things and what, what feels right. And then taking a happy medium and moving forward. Right? You might have a little slowdown like that, but... Um, not the end of the world, right? You're getting the states to transition. All right, back. There we go. I'm actually going to make my spinning a bit faster too. So all I'm doing here now is I'm, I'm making some changes to these clips. Remember, we didn't actually check any of these files out. And I'm going to showcase the uh, reconcile offline work. So let's make this a So now it's a, a second and a half. All right, there we go. Looks good. So moving forward, let's go ahead and stop this. Let's go ahead and um, first thing, let's go ahead and update our prefab. I want to make the point of a little bit of how awesome it is about how we made this hierarchy uh, and how this is going to allow us to utilize this in other places in our level. Right, so now we have this prefab. If I drop these in my world, right, what's really awesome with how this hierarchy is set up is because our animation isn't on the root object, isn't on this itself. If you put your animator on this root, it's now using world space. So if you wanted to do something like this where you rotate them, right? I want to have these different prefabs. You know, I have a bunch in my level and they're all facing different ways or there's different instances of them of the, in the level. This will now work and these will all exist because how our hierarchy has been built. Let me go ahead and turn all these on just to show you that. Turn that one on. Turn this one on. All right, they're all working because they're local space to this wind turbine prefab game object. All right, if you put these in world space and try and do the same thing, they're all just going to snap to the same location. All right, they're all animated based on this 
game object right here where this exists. And hopefully that makes sense. So I'm going to go ahead and delete my other prefabs. I just have this one. just like to show that little demonstration. Uh, make sure yours does that. Make sure that they all are working accordingly. All right, so apply that. I'm going to go ahead and save my project and my scenes, right, because I did make changes in my scene. So now let's go ahead back to Perforce. So I did the mistake of I didn't check anything out in Perforce, right? That's definitely a bad workflow. You should always get in the habit of checking out the files before it is you're working on them. But the Reconcile Offline Work feature, what this is going to do is scan your computer for any changes or differences, right? And it's going to put those files into a list for you. Right? So that's what it's going to do, and I'm about to perform that moving forward. But thinking about what Get Latest Revision does and why this is so scary, if I clicked Get Latest Revision right now with all these files changed on my computer, what Get Latest Revision does, hopefully everyone knows, right, is it copies what's on the depot exactly to my workspace. So all the changes I just did are going to get overwritten and over wiped, right, or wiped out by Perforce because it's going to match what's on the depot, right, and that happens with teams when I, see, you know, with teammates working with you, you haven't checked anything out because you want to reconcile your offline work at the end of the day. You, uh, you know, your teammate says, hey, I just updated my level or I just changed the terrain. Go ahead and get latest revision on the project. You're, without thinking, you just say, okay, and you go and click this button. By the time you hit click, uh, by the time you click your mouse, you know, it's overwritten all of those files. So that's where the pitfall comes in. But if you understand what these two things will do, um, you will avoid that from happening. So if I go ahead and do it on the folder that I want to reconcile from, right? So I'm going to start with just the wind turbine experiments folder and reconcile offline work. All right, and this is what it found. So this is the window that's going to come up. So this, these are the changes that Unity found, right? So, or that Perforce found. It breaks it up into three windows. Here are modified files, right? Files that I checked out, or files that are going to be checked out, apologize. Um, right, this is going to be things that exist on the depot that Perforce is going to check out. It, it found that these files are different. This middle window down here, these are files that are not on the depot. Right, this would show any files that you have added and it will mark those for add. If you delete anything from your workspace and then reconcile offline work, if those files are missing, right, Perforce is going to mark them for delete. Right, so if I hit reconcile, it's going to add those to the change list. Just to show this even further, I'm going to go back to Unity real quick. In this turbine experiments, I'm going to create a material. I'm just going to call this Reconcile test. Okay, so there's a material in my project. If I come back to Perforce and reconcile offline work again, there's that reconcile test material and the meta file, right? New files, mark them for add. Hit reconcile, now they're just in my list, right? So I'm back to where I started. So if you use this feature, don't ever reconcile from the root project. Hopefully you know the reason why. But the reason why is, if you reconcile this, it's going to find your library file, right? And mark those for add, which is, which is bad, right? We can definitely, we can sort that out, but make sure you avoid that from happening. Don't only ever reconcile from the assets. So if I reconcile offline work from the assets, right, it found, look, it found a meta file in my folder that wasn't on the depot. I should make sure I go ahead and add that. Right, so it's a good way to catch those meta files or any changes that you may have missed, any files that you missed. But don't ever do it from the project. Only go as high as the assets or the project settings. So here is my change list here. Now I'm going to go ahead and submit this. Right, and this is the completion of the second experiment. I'm going to say created all animation clips and set up transitions. All right, and that is the end of the second experiment.
Join us back in the third video to complete the third experiment.